church. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I missed last week, and I don't generally miss church. I felt okay, but, you know, um, something going around there that everybody's got. I still have a little bit of a dry cough. Do you mind if I turn this thing off and get rid of it and use that? Because I may move. We just never been very good at standing still and the teachers had understood that when I was a boy I did real well with other teachers that did not understand that I struggled with well, such is life um, yeah so I hear some of you out there still got a little bit of a dry cough I certainly do um, I don't know why it's there it just doesn't seem to want to go away but I feel fine um, our little talk today, I have given the words, the sword or the pen, which you suppose is might the sword or the pen. Civil or religious authority? What's most important to you? You know, we are certainly going back into the days of the Roman Empire, it looks to me. And um, I don't know if you know much about history, but one thing I have learned is that we don't learn anything from history. <laughs> it seems like we're heading back in that direction. So much of the Roman life was all around the gods and everything that you did. I mean, even Christian people couldn't even go to a funeral because they would be end up worshiping another god. And it was in every aspect of the Roman life. And it's a very difficult thing. I mean, here today, we have the masked and the unmasked. You know, when people... This whole thought process of this world that we're living in today is just craziness. The, our forefathers that gave us this great nation believed in freedom, right? What does freedom mean? Freedom means to me the right to be wrong, okay? Um, God says this is the way walk ye in, but he doesn't make you do that, right? What do we call that? Power of choice. Power of choice. Okay. Do you respect the power of choice in freedom. people? Freedom of choice. The freedom of choice in people to make their own decisions? You know, I'm amazed in how things can get so flipped around in this world today. You know, uh, you have the my body, my choice people that it's, it's okay on this aspect, but on the other, well, well, then that's a different story. Freedom. What does freedom mean to you? It meant everything to Jesus Christ. That's why he came and died for you, to set you free. Okay? Matthew 22. This is... Uh, I'm going to begin in verse 15. I got a little heading above my Bible there in Matthew 15. It says, paying tribute to Caesar. Right? Mm -hmm. um, then went the Pharisees and took counsel on how they might entangle him in his talk. They were constantly trying to trip up Jesus. And you know, you think about this, every moment of his life, the enemy was on his heels, right? Because his whole existence depends upon him failing or not, right? Jesus, if, if Je Jesus could have failed this mission, right? I mean, if he couldn't have failed the mission, then there was no mission, right? I mean, um, 
my wife doesn't like this about me. I'm an nth degree guy. I care about where we're at and where we're going to be. My wife, on the other hand, she's concerned with all these parts in the middle. I guess that's what makes us good together because I really don't care about this part. But she does. And, um, you know, we're all different. I mean, if we were both the same, one of us would be useless, right? <laughs> it would probably be me if we were both the same. Because she's certainly prettier than I am. Anyways, as we continue on, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. So they're giving him kudos, right? They still want to stab him. And teaches the way of God in truth, neither is care thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. So what is that saying? Marty wrote it as, he doesn't play favorites, right? God sees everybody equal, correct? Is that how he treats us? Yeah, he does. You know, people talk about favorite children. And I don't think anybody really has favorite children, so to speak. We love our children, but some of our children are easier to love than others, right? <laughs> Hello? So, you know, there's more reciprocal uh, affection there. We'll put it that way. It doesn't mean you just love that one any more than you do the other one. It's just my thought. <laughs> Everybody's entitled to their opinion, although I know you didn't come here to hear my opinion on anything. You came here to hear the word of God. So tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Can you just imagine the attitude of these guys? Oh, well, you can because you hear Jesus' response. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, you hypocrites? Does that sound like he was looking directly into their soul? I think so. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't ever fool Jesus. Okay? It's not going to happen. Not in this world or the world to come. Show me the tribute money, he says. And they brought him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose image and superscription? You know, like Jesus didn't know. I love the way he does this. <laughs> but he doesn't know. But that was not his focus, right? His focus wasn't worldly things. His focus was people. That's what his focus was. Not governments. He didn't come to overthrow a government. He came to overthrow the nature of man and the devil. Sin. And he did it, praise God. Amen. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith unto them, Render thou for unto Caesar, this is Jesus' words, the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they, were, they marveled and left him and went their way. What does that mean that they were marveled? Speechless might be another word. I like the word speechless because that's what I hear when I read marvel because they're just, what do you say? How did he get out of this trap? Yeah. You know, they were constantly throwing a trap for Jesus. But you know, you cannot fight somebody that's already been there. God has already been at tomorrow. Okay? So he's telling you not to worry and not to fret about tomorrow. We only get 24 hours at a time. Tomorrow's not here yet. We don't even know, to be honest, if tomorrow will come. Okay? But God does. And you cannot fight somebody who's already seen the fight. You can't trap him. You can't trick him. You might as well just submit. 
because you can't win the fight. It's just that simple. You know, and you think about how wonderful Jesus is. I mean, you remember when they were telling him that he had to pay the tax? Right? Well, you had to pay the tax? And Jesus is like, huh. I'm sure his thought was, you don't even know who I am. I don't have to pay the tax. But he tells Peter, Peter, go to the water and pick up a fish and you'll pull out a coin out of that fish's mouth. Okay? This blows your mind, right? <laughs> Just go to the water and pick up a fish. He's got a coin in his mouth. And you know what? Go pay the tribute for me and for you. Right? Wow. This is, this is the kind of God we serve. If he's asking you to do something, he's going to take care of you. Right? He always takes care of you. We don't, we don't see things like God sees things. And we don't understand things. And you know what? Some of us have to go through some horrible experiences to get things right with God, to see it. Because, you know, some of us are just stubborn. Me being one of them. I want to confess to you all here right now that I am stubborn. I'm a rascal. I'm telling you, I, if, if I was God, I'd have given up on me a long time ago. Amen. <laughs> but he never gives up. He never gives up. The Holy Spirit woos until the very end. We may become so callous by not listening that we don't hear anymore, but that doesn't mean God has ever stopped. Hallelujah. Because he never stops. Hallelujah. He is the avenger of blood. You realize that from the Old Testament. God himself is the avenger of blood. But he's trying to get you into the safe city. That is his desire, not to take your life, but to save it. Religion, brothers and sisters, um, I love this. this is the definition that I love the most. There's plenty of them. Um, this is my favorite. It may be yours. The duty which we owe to our Creator and the manner of discharging it. That's the, that's the definition that I like for religion. Do we display the reverence that God deserves? Are we casual? I'm afraid I'm casual. I realized today in Sabbath school class when we were talking about the scriptures that I've, I've become kind of casual in the scriptures. You know, um, this, this is a holy, holy book. And, uh, you know, you, you may think you know a bunch of stuff, but, you know, there's words in this book that state that we know nothing as we ought to know it. So we need, to, we need to take everything we think we know and shrink it down so that we can get filled up with the stuff we ought to know. Amen. I want to define morality too as we're talking about the sword and the pen and this whole civil and religious argument this world, I think, and maybe some people see it, maybe some people don't see it, but it's happening. Morality is the conformity of an act to the divine will, the divine law, you may say. Right? I'm going to repeat it for you. Morality is, my definition here, the conformity of an act to the divine law. God's perfect law. That angels were keeping and didn't even know there was such a thing. Imagine that. Think about it. See, we can become very mechanical and worried about behavior 
rather than the relationship with Christ that we ought to have. The behavior is a symptom. Okay? It's not the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Behavior is something that will follow suit if the relationship is right. And the focus is right. So both of these things, religion and morality, have to do with God solely. Civil government can have nothing to do with either. I, you know what, if I was saying this back in the early 1800s or the late 1700s, you know how this whole place would roar with amen. Nothing. This is the world we live in today. I want to read that again to you. So both of these, religion and morality, both of these have to do with God solely. So civil government can have nothing to do with either. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's turn to 1 Samuel. First Samuel um, chapter thirteen. You remember this fellow named Saul? I'm sure you do. Right? Your Old Testament, you've heard of Saul. So in verse uh, 1, chapter 13, it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gideon of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard him. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Is something wrong with this money? Yep. Samuel said to Saul, 
thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. So what was happening here? Saul was being tested, right? Where's your focus? Who are you looking at? These are the armies of the God of Israel, right? What are they afraid of? Why are they fearful? What's the focus? Who are they looking to? Themselves. You know, Saul's looking at the people being fearful. He's not looking at God, right? He could have certainly offered prayer, right? But he was not to do the work of a prophet, right? He's not a prophet. He's not a priest. He's a king, right? There's only one who is prophet and priest and king. Mm -hmm. Only one. And did you hear Saul's word, uh, Samuel's words? You, you, you would have been established forever. How quick are we to fall and, and, and lose faith? He said seven days, right? So the seven-day time came up, and he's watching his watch. Seven days. Okay, boom, here it is. Let's do the sacrifice. Let's get this thing on the road. And then Samuel the prophet comes. The moment, the Bible says it, right? The moment he was done. What lesson is there for us there? Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Right? Do we do it? Do any of us do it? What about what about Aaron? Remember Aaron? He got all freaked out about the people too, right? The people, they're gonna beat me up or something. It may take away my birthday. I don't know. So what's he do? This golden calf just jumps out of the fire. That's what he said. Right? He just jumped out of the fire. These are men chosen of God. Was it Saul? A chosen vessel of God? Aaron. Aaron was chosen. Brothers and sisters, all of us are chosen. Amen. We're going to go through some horrible, horrific times. And if your eye is on anything but what it needs to be, Amen. you're going to fail. You're going to fall. Because the devil has got so many things for us to look at. Mm -hmm. And these little hooks that he likes to these little sins that so easily beset each and every one of us. I don't know what yours are, but I know what mine are. We need to give it all to God. Saul endeavoring to vindicate his own course, and here's the problem. And blame the prophet instead of condemning himself. How often when reproof comes, do we not just fall upon our knees? Reproof can come from anywhere. If God wants to humble you, then you just be humbled. Okay? And go on with it. If God says something you don't like, you better accept it. And move forward. And look to Him because He has grace and He has forgiveness. And he has love that knows no bounds. God is fair and loving, but he's dangerous. You hear me? Amen. He's dangerous. I hope you
You understand what I'm trying to say? He's God. Absolutely. Amen. We ought to be in holy awe. You know, um, we're, we, there's been a, a movement here to be to begin to be more reverent in the sanctuary. And I think it's a great thing. Um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. and Nobody's going to beat anybody else up. But we, we want to get there. It's a place that we want to get to. You know? I mean, here we are, the Adventist church, with all the truth that all these other reformers took little pieces of. We got the whole bunch of the pieces together. I'm not saying we got everything right, because we don't. Amen. But we got more than the rest. And we, we're lacking this thing. I mean, have you ever walked into a Catholic church? There's an awe. We want to have that here, okay? But we want to have everything else, too, that God wants for us. Amen. We're seeking his face. Saul was not a priest or a Levite. Saul was a king, right? <clears throat> Samuel was the prophet. But I, I want to read you something else. Let's turn to 2 Samuel, the next book. 2 Samuel, uh, the last chapter, I believe, is 24, right? 24, 18. Let's start in verse 18. Let me get good to say in a minute. And Gad came that day to David. Who's Gad? He's another prophet. Okay? And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Okay? I'm going to just skip down to verse 25. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, so the Lord was entreated for the land. And the plague was stayed from Israel. Now, wait a second here. We got David, who's a king, offering sacrifice, right? But the prophet of God, who speaks for God, told him to do so. Now, listen, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of confusing things that can happen. If you're not listening, to the right one, you can screw up. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Abraham when he was told to kill his son? Can you imagine what that must have been like? He had to know that he knew who was talking to him. Because this is not like God to tell you take a life, right? Your own son's life who has done nothing wrong. What's the point here that we're trying to make? You got to dig in, brothers and sisters. You can't have casual contact with God. Amen. You have to have deep intimacy to make it through the muddy waters that we're in. Because it's disgustingly filthy on this planet. Everywhere you look. And I see it in my own heart. Sometimes I can't even bear to look in the mirror. What I see in my eyes. And I know we all struggle. Everybody struggles. Their focus has to be right. I want to read you a little something. If you have given yourself to God to do His work, you have no need to be anxious for tomorrow. He whose servant you are knows the end from the beginning. The events of tomorrow which are hidden from your view are open to the eyes of Him who is omnipotent. When we take into our hands the management of things with which we have to do and depend upon our 